All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to class number four on Law and Grace. I know we've been doing a lot of law. I haven't even really talked about grace much other than right at the beginning. Um, so I'm going to jump into the fourth class on law. Only now we're going to be doing a New Testament perspective on a particular aspect of it. And you're going to see where this is all leading as we go. And we're touching on many things in terms of defining and understanding that we're going to be going through in detail when we read a lot of Romans and a lot of Galatians, particularly that are going to speak on these things. And so we're going to be touching those some more. But what we're going to talk about tonight is circumcision. Circumcision is very interesting because it was the sign of a covenant given to Abraham. Abraham was given a covenant. Um, God promised him things. And a sign of that covenant was circumcision. Now, circumcision was continued under the law. It was a big deal under the law. Um, understand that, um, you know, when you think about Moses, Moses, his boys apparently hadn't been circumcised, and he was back down with Israel, and somebody was coming and was going to kill them because you weren't allowed to be in the congregation uncircumcised. And, you know, the, the, the writing is not as clear. I don't know. I'm not, I didn't take the time to go study into it and, and, under, and understand it in particular, but if, just to comment on what's going on, it was such a big deal that his wife had to circumcise the two boys right there, take the foreskins, throw them down at his feet, and say, basically, you're a bloody husband to me, you know, calling this a bloody barbaric practice, which in some ways it actually is. Um, and it was a big deal. It was a part of the covenant. And it just, what it goes to show, the whole point of relating that story is just to talk about the fact that this was extremely important within the people of Israel going all the way back to Abraham. This sign of the covenant, it set them apart from the world. The world was not circumcised. They were very much set apart. The men were identifiable. You couldn't hide and say, I'm, I'm really not a Jew. I'm really not. You couldn't hide. It was basically an identifying mark. Now, that's no longer the case today. We don't live in those times. But this, this sign of the covenant was a very big deal. And circumcision of the heart is not a solely a New Testament concept. It's a concept that was discussed even in Deuteronomy, um, where, you know, circumcise your hearts was, was said to them in Deuteronomy. Okay? Um, this sign of the covenant was important, therefore, to them, but it was an earthly thing. And Paul's going to deal with it, and we're going to deal with it, and we're going to see how important it was here. And it helps us in understanding how the law and its ordinances and its earthly ordinances related to how the church functioned in a time when many, many Gentiles were being saved, and what did they need to do. Okay, so let's start in Acts chapter 15. In Acts 15, um, is a council. It's a council of people, of pillars in the church, that come together. Um, certain men came from Judea and taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Circumcision was so important to them. Even though these people had come into faith in Christ Jesus, they believed this, that you needed to be circumcised, that only circumcision could come in. Now, we're going to touch on it, but you remember that uh, Peter had gone um, to the Gentiles first. And um, I said, we'll read that in a minute. But he'd gone to the Gentiles first, and they had received the Holy Ghost the same as them. So that's like, whoa, goodness, these guys can receive the Holy Ghost. So verse 2 of chapter 15 says, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. This, is a, this became a really big issue. And because there was such dissension and disputation, because they could not come to an agreement, they took it to the church. Just like it tells us in the scripture to do, that if you have an issue with your brother, take it to him privately. If you can't resolve it, bring two or three witnesses. If you can't resolve it, then take it to the church. It had to be a big deal. It wasn't like just he, you know, it was a bad, he had a bad day and didn't treat me right. I mean, it was a, some big deal where somebody had treated you wrong. Well, this disputation was a big deal enough that they determined, and certain others, they go to Jerusalem 
to the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria and declared the conversion of the Gentiles. And verse 5, there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together, verse 6, to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, I mean, it's a big argument, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And if you remember the story, it was just a miracle after miracle after miracle that Peter ended up there. And God which knows the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. Now that, the Holy Ghost is a better symbol than circumcision. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. And so this, here we hear this very important statement, heart purified by faith. Notice we haven't even talked about grace yet. And we're going to get there. But faith is inherently important in understanding where grace comes from. So then he says, now why do you tempt God? This is Peter talking. To put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Same grace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He purified their hearts by faith because they believed on him. But we believe that through the grace, we shall be saved even as they. In other words, we're not saved by works of righteousness, which we have done, but we are saved by grace. Oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. It's coming. It's coming. Um, so, we see the circumcision issue become a big deal, and it's getting in the way of understanding exactly how we're saved. And that's why Peter says this. So then all the multitude kept silence, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered and said, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simeon has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written. And this is a quote. After this I will return, rebuild again the, tabl build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, says the Lord who does all these things. And then uh, James says, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world, wherefore my sentence is, that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. But we write unto them, that they abstain from pollution of idols, from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses of old time has in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So he's telling them, no, no idolatry, no fornication, no eating things that were strangled, in other words, with the blood and refraining from the blood. Blood being a big deal, and that's why he says Moses is them that preach and the synagogues every Sabbath day. Because the life of the flesh is in the blood. We read some of that in the law. I mean, this is a, this was a very big deal, and he felt that this was an important thing, and this was not a thing that was going to harm anybody. And then it pleased the apostles, elders, with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren, Send greetings unto the brethren which are in the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as you have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, shall also tell you the same things by mouth, 
For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, and then he repeats them. This council, it's the first big council of the church, where they all come together and discuss this. Now, when Peter came back, having preached the Gentiles the first time, there was also a council like, Peter, why did you go and you ate? We, we heard that you ate with the Gentiles and you went in, in unto them. This is, you should not have done, basically. What are you doing? And then he relates what God did, and everything's made okay. So this is a big deal. We believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved. But circumcision is not a part of that. But yet, as we've already established, circumcision was huge in the promise, which we talked about on the first class, and in the law. Huge, big, big stuff. And yet, they're saying it's not important for the Gentile Christians. So, we're seeing here an understanding of how the law is brought into the church. There were those that went and said, you must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. And the judgment of the church was, no, you don't. No, you don't. Remember, Jesus fulfilled all these things. So let's just read some other scriptures on circumcision and some other areas. John 7, 22. Jesus talking. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it's of Moses, but of the fathers. Again, the circumcision is instituted with Abraham. And you on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry at me because I've made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? <sighs> judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Jesus is given an understanding of, look, you talk about this law thing, but you'll break the law in order to make, make sure another law is not broken. The guy who's doing the circumcision is working on the Sabbath. I mean, come on. He shouldn't be doing that. But yet it's so important that he get circumcised on the eighth day that we'll circumcise on the Sabbath. He's going, look, the law's never been the issue. The issue here is I've made somebody every bit whole. I've, I've reached out with the power of God and seen a man get healed. And you're upset because it's on the Sabbath day? I mean, what, what is wrong with you people? You have exalted the law, which points to sin, above the relationship with God. Um, let's go to Acts chapter 7, verse 8. And it's just, I mean, you don't even have to go there. This is Stephen talking. He gave, them, he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. In other words, reestablishing that this is when it began. We already know this, but this is when it began. And um, Acts chapter 10 and 11 is where you know Peter makes his defense of eating with the uncircumcised, entering into the house of the uncircumcised. Because they're questioning him. What are you doing, Peter? And he makes his defense. I mean, what's his defense? His defense is God led me. God showed me. God said to me, what I've made clean, don't any man call unclean. He says, I, th you're calling this uncleanness, but this is never what it was. It was representing. It was helping you to understand. But it's never you never were clean because you took the foreskin off. Okay, very important. Um, so let's go to Romans chapter 2. We're going to spend a lot of time in the early chapters of Romans later relating this to um, uh, law and grace. But let's just let's just go to this at the end of chapter 2. Um, and let's look at uh, verse 20. We should go to verse 25. I don't want to read the whole thing, but we should do verse 25. Circumcision truly profits if you keep the law. But if you be a breaker of the law, Thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. In other words, it's the breaking of the law that was the issue here. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keeps the righteousness of the law, we talked about the royal law, loving your neighbor as yourself. We talked about loving the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we also talked about Jesus' law, 
in his commandment, which was that every one of you um, love one another even as I have loved you. In other words, we're laying down your life. So if the uncircumcision keeps the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So he's helping us to understand that circumcision, uncircumcision, we'll read a bunch of scriptures, and it, just, it doesn't even matter. It has no bearing on the issue. Um, we're going to be looking, like I said, at that in detail. We're going to be looking at what advantage then has the Jew or what profit is there at circumcision. That's Romans chapter 3 all the way through 30. Let me just read 30 to you. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith, remember that, and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish, or in a sense, we fulfill the law. And so that what we talked about last time, about Jesus fulfilled the law, this is also this. Is the law was meant, and I want to reemphasize this from like class number two, the law was meant to point a rebellious and wicked people to a relationship with God. It was meant to show them their sin, to show them their need, and give them a way to come before God. Because the trouble was, is they were so fearful. Because of the darkness that was in them. They were so fearful. They did not see God and his love and mercy towards them. They saw a living God who would destroy them if they came near. And while that was true in a certain sense, God was making a way for them to enter. So we, he made it, instituted a bunch of ordinances and washings and covenants and garments and veils and, and all this stuff that was instituted to show them where they were, how they could approach, and how they could receive from him, right? So faith, by faith, we receive the fulfillment of all of that in Christ Jesus, and we have to bear with none of it. We don't have to do it. We don't have to obtain to it. We don't have to generate it. We don't have to become it. We don't have to do any of those things. And that's the theme that we're talking about here. So, both circumcision and uncircumcision are saved by faith in this case. Um, and are made righteous, I should say, by faith. That's a very important distinction. Romans chapter 4, um, verse 11, uh, again, talking about uh, Abraham. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they're not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but also walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had, being yet uncircumcised. This is Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, we're, again, we're going to look at it in detail, talking about the righteousness that comes by faith. Um, as we discuss law and grace, but here we are, that Abraham re was received righteousness for his faith that he had when he was uncircumcised. The circumcision was a sign it was an indication. It was a flag that you know you could raise, saying, "Yes, this is what has happened." Um, so, what mattered was the circumcision on the inside, it the faith that's on the inside, the belief that's on the inside. You don't come to God through the works of righteousness that you have done. You come to God because of what He has done. All right, let's look at a few more. We're just gonna we're just trying to f flesh out this whole picture. Romans chapter fifteen, verse eight. Um, starting verse seven. Wherefore receive you one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. 
Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made to the fathers. He was a minister of the circumcision. He was of them. He was circumcised the eighth day. For the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he says, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, in another place, Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. Um, notice, Taking the two, again, there's going to be, there's a lot of talk in Romans about taking the two and joining them together, and we're going to discuss that in, in detail. But when he's saying this is, Jesus was a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises. He came to confirm them. In other words, like we talked about last week, to fulfill them. Galatians chapter 2 is going to do a lot of differentiation. We're not going to talk about that now because we're going to do Galatians chapter 2 in extreme detail. Um... Let's just look quickly at a couple of others. Galatians 5, 6. All of Galatians 5 we will be doing. But 5, 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision avails anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith, which works by love. Notice that. Galatians 6, 15. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision avails anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. This is also said in Colossians 3, 11. That set right there, there's the judgment put down into a nutshell. Circumcision nor uncircumcision matters. Faith that works by love matters, and a new creation matters. That's it. Um, we'll look at Ephesians 2.11. Wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. They weren't part, you weren't part of that. Having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. So you being uncircumcised at that time was a big deal. You were cut off from the commonwealth of Israel. You could not be a part. And it's true that if you wanted to come and join in that their covenant with God, you had to be circumcised. That was that was true for them. But now you that sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. So we're seeing some things here. We're seeing faith, right? We're seeing the blood of Christ Jesus. And we're seeing the grace that came through Christ Jesus. These are all things that are going to make a difference in this situation as it resides. Um, let's look at this. Um, there's a number of places here. This is Philippians chapter 3. Paul tells us something very special about this. Remember, we, we started with Acts 15, where they're having a council to deal with these people that came from Judea and came up and said, if you're going to be Christians, you've got to be circumcised, keep the law of Moses. And Paul then later, you know, years later, is, is warning people. He says, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision or those that want to come and have you get circumcised. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And this is what is so important about not keeping the law. Because up to now, it's like, well, it doesn't matter. You can be circumcised, you can be not circumcised. doesn't matter. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he has wherever he might trust in the flesh, I more. And Paul will begin to relate. I was of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day, blah, blah, blah. blah. He, was okay. he was blameless, according to the, the law. But what's he saying? He says, look, I have no confidence in the flesh. He said, you think you can have confidence in the flesh? You think you can do something, mark your body in some way, do something that's going to bring you in through the flesh into this covenant with God? I'm going to tell you right now, I had more than you'll ever have, and it gained me nothing. I count it but dung. 
Why? Because my confidence, I rejoice in Christ Jesus in the Spirit. Which is why the circumcision that we have is not of the Spirit, it's of the heart. We'll look at another one. Colossians 2.11 In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. I can take my hands. I know how to do this. I can circumcise people. I've done lots of them. Um, but there's a circumcision that's not done with hands. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Remember we talked about how when we talk about Jesus fulfilling, he was the offering. There's no more need of bringing a blood of a lamb or a bull or a goat to represent him because he's already offered. All right? So in the same way, Jesus is the circumcision. Okay? Um, buried with him in baptism, wherein ye also are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircum uncircumcision of your flesh has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your sins, all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, all the things in the law that pointed to your, your, your otherness, that pointed to your separation, that pointed to the fact that you couldn't draw an eye, all those things, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. This is fundamental to understanding these things. You are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. He comes and circumcises the heart. Nothing matters but faith that works by love. Nothing matters but a new creation. We know about the new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're a new creation made of God. All things are made brand new. All things are of God. This is the new creation that is made. When is that new creation made? That's what it means to be born again. We've been born of the Spirit, born of the Word, brought into a spiritual life, and our, we have been circumcised. What happens? We're buried with Him in baptism. It's, it's signifying. Baptism signifies a death and a burial. But there's also a rising from the dead. You're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. The faith of Christ Jesus is what does this work. He's the one who does it. Um, who has raised him from the dead. Raised from the dead. The operation of God who has raised him from the dead. And you, you're dead in your sins and uncircumcised in the flesh. And he makes you alive and forgives all of your sins. That's what circumcision is. All the sins that are against you have been taken away. You don't need the law to teach you any longer. You don't need the law to show you how far away you are from God. You have been made near by the blood of Christ Jesus. Jesus took all the ordinances that was against us, all that was contrary to us, and he nailed it to his cross. And he spoiled the principalities and powers. They were defeated. He made a show of them openly and triumphed over them. This is what circumcision signified. Remember, Abraham had lived his life believing God against all evidence that these things were going to happen. And there was a sign of circumcision given him because of the righteousness that he had received by faith. He received real righteousness. He received an ability to interact with God at a level that nobody before him had ever had. That interaction with God is what the law testified of when because of their transgressions, God put the law in place to give them away. If any man wants to come and appear before God, the beginning of Leviticus, let him bring his offering and let him lay his hands on it and kill it a certain way and do a certain thing and eat so much of it and burn so much of it and do all these things. And there were all of these offerings and all of these ordinances to allow a man to come and interact with a living God while yet remembering his sin. Today, because of Christ Jesus, we have a circumcision that has removed 
all of the sins, all of the trespasses, because his blood has come and paid the price. It is, it is well able to take away all your sin and to bring you into a place where your conscience no longer is defiled and you can stand before a living God and you can talk to him and receive from him and there is nothing between he and you. That's what circumcision is about. When I trust in an earthly circumcision, I must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to be a Christian. I am taking myself back into the bondage of what I must do instead of living in the faith of what Jesus has done. And when we talk about the grace of God, you're going to see how the grace of God works alongside the righteousness and holiness of the law. It works alongside of it and fulfills within the life of the believer all that's in the law without the keeping of all the ordinances and all the things. It's because of Christ Jesus. So bottom line on this, 1 Corinthians 7.17. Go ahead and look it up. But as God has distributed to every man, as the Lord has called every one, so let him walk. And so ordain I in all churches. This is what I teach every church I've started, every people I've brought together. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. You don't need to go have surgery to put it back. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised and have to go get it cut off. Because circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Understand, I just want to reiterate this for all of you. Understand this that the most important thing here is to, to see the relationship between the law and the new covenant. We don't go and get circumcised and keep the law of Moses and do all of the things that the Jew had to do. We don't do that. And we're going to get into that in detail with Paul in Romans and in Galatians particularly, looking over in detail his arguments to help us understand how that worked, and we're going to be contrasting with grace. First, before we do that, we're going to define grace for you, and we're going to go through that, but that's a subsequent class. So Romans 3, Romans 4, Galatians 2, Galatians 3, summarized in Galatians 5 and 6, we're going to be doing that. So let's look at another one in Philippians, in chapter 3, verse 9. Be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. In other words, he that does them shall live by them. And Paul concludes in Romans that all of those that said they were under the law and kept the law, they were all dead in their sins. He says, look, I, was, I had everything perfect and I was dead in my sins. But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Abraham received righteousness because of his faith. The Habakkuk tells, taught us, the just shall live by faith. This is saying, not the righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. Now notice something. It's not through the faith of you, the believer. It's the faith of Christ Jesus. He's done this work. You didn't do it. He redeemed you. You didn't redeem yourself. He obtained righteousness for you. You did not obtain it for yourself. Jesus did this work, and he did it by faith. He acted in faith, believing God, and it was the righteousness that he received that he passes upon everyone who will believe he gives unto us this righteousness, this work of being born again, becoming a new creature, Jew, Gentile, whoever you may be, brought into one new man, the faith of Christ. Notice, Abraham, because of his faith, this passed upon his generations. They, they received a blessing from God, and yes, they walked in it, Isaac walked in it, we don't know as much about Isaac as we know about Abraham, but we know that he walked in it. Jacob, 
received it and walked in it. It was testified that it was his from the time he was born. And I don't want to get into all that again. I think we've talked about it in one of our classes. It's very important to recognize that when he took the birthright from Esau, that wasn't, that wasn't the blessing. The blessing was not the birthright. They were separate. They were different. And the blessings was Jacob's from the beginning, though the birthright was Esau's, and he sold it to Jacob's. And the Jacob ended up with both. Um, but Abraham's faith brought a righteousness that allowed God to work with his descendants, and that's why he then redeemed them and bought them out of bondage in Egypt and brought them out of that place and was going to dwell with them, but they transgressed against his covenant. And therefore the law entered in to point to man his need. You are so far removed from me, you need to be changed. You are so far removed from me, all you do is fall into sin. You are so far removed from me that you can't even come near me unless you do all these prescribed things so that you might know that I'm a holy God and that I can then have some fellowship with you. But remember, only one of you can even come into the holiest place and that not without the blood, not without all the ritual, and you got to do it just right. you got to come in and do it. And then you will buy a year for your people. I mean, this is this was what the law was. It was a constant reminder of sin. The new covenant, sin's been taken away. Totally taken away. So let's look at one more thing. Galatians 3.10. Let's look at this. For as many as are of the works of the law are under its curse, the curse. For it is written, cursed is every one that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And he's quoting Habakkuk 2.4 there. And Romans will have that in it as well. And we're going to get back to, to, that's the next step in this thing. But again, like I told you, we have to define grace first. So I want to reiterate at this point where we've come from. We talked about Galatians 1.6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you under the grace of Christ unto another gospel. There's a grace of Christ, a working that God does in the believer. Okay, and that's what we're touching on here. This grace that's that is given to something else. What had they done? They were listening to people who told them that they needed to keep the law. So we began to look at where does this come from? And we talked about um, the promise because you cannot you cannot understand the law until you understand the promise. And we discussed the promise to Abraham. We discussed that it, what he did for them in Exodus and how he bought them back and how he, he brought them unto himself and how he had communion with them and he had a relationship with them. Which covenant they broke? They broke it. And, and that was a terrible thing. So um, Hebrews 6, 13, 14, 15 14 saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. These were this was Abraham. He believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness. We moved on to talk about the law. And we mentioned this scripture. Sin shall not have dominion over you, Romans 6 14, for you are not under the law, but under grace. You're not under the law. You're under grace. And that's how we're going to see the difference here. We're not under the law. We're under grace. Well, how do they work? Well, what did the law do? It reminded them of their sin. It reminded them of their need. It reminded them of their transgression. And in verse 15 it says, Well, then shall we continue to sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. And I thought that was important for you to get down. That was a, a hallmark scripture for class number two. Because you need to understand that it's all about getting the sin out. Being under grace does not give you a license to sin. And that's sadly been very common, at least out here in the West of the United States, for, for you know, 35 years, 50 years, has been very common, this idea that being under grace means you can sin and get away with it and it doesn't matter anymore. Which has nothing to do with grace. Nothing at all to do with it. Okay? Um, and we know that grace and truth came by Jesus. So we talked about the law, and we talked about where it came from, and what we saw very, very clearly 
was this was a holiness code. It was an understanding of how do you approach to God. He had given them some commandments. They were all about relationship with him and relationship with one another. Hey, don't steal one another's stuff. Don't take one another's wives. Don't give yourself over to debauchery and sins against your own body. Don't do these things. Okay, It was very simple stuff. But they, in their transgression, are now cut off from him, and he's not. he wants to take them up in the promised land. He says to Moses, okay, they've messed up. I'm cutting them all off. I'm just going to take you and start over. <laughs> That's what he said. And Moses pled with them, oh God, what will they not say of you? And and God, you know, he he repented him of that statement, and he began to say, okay, I'm going to take go with you. I'll send my angel. I'm not going to go with you myself. And Moses was pretty upset by that. Well, God made a way that he could come and have fellowship, at least with Moses, and with maybe a few others in some varying degrees. He could go, go to the tabernacle, and when Moses went there, the cloud that was up above them would descend upon the tabernacle, and he, he would commune with Moses face to face. I believe that's what he meant to do with all of them. That's what he wanted to do with everybody. He wanted to have a deep and abiding covenant with them, but they broke it right off. It didn't take long. Within, you know, weeks, they broke the covenant. So God made the law to show them their need, to show them their problems, but give them a way that in their sinful state, in their state of, of being messed up, that they could interact with him. Now, how similar is this to the original covenant that God made with Adam? He said, Adam, everything's yours. You can have all of it. Just don't eat this one. Just don't do that. And Adam broke the covenant very quickly. And God's like, oh my goodness. So he made skins for him, but he had to drive him out of the garden. He had to take the fellowship. He had to make it different. Well, when he bought Israel out, remember, with a mighty hand, he redeemed them. He paid the price for them. What was the price? All the firstborn died. And all of Egypt and their firstborn were only saved by the blood that was applied to the doorposts and the eating of the lamb inside and, and the, the eat my flesh, drink my blood of the time. And they were brought out and they were circumcised in, in heart. They were baptized in the Red Sea. They received a covenant, but they did what? They were brought back to this relationship. They broke it. So the law entered. And we're gonna when we study it in detail, you're gonna be able to see that more, more clearly. And we made it clear that in this law, that it was this relationship law. It was meant to say, hey guys, I want you to come and relate to me. So he'd say things like, set yourselves apart, be holy, for I am the Lord your God, and you keep my statutes and do them, and I'm the one, I'm the one who sanctifies you. And we read that scripture. If you keep my statutes and my judgments, if a man do them, he's going to live in them. You can live in these. You can walk this way. You can do this thing. Okay. And then we talked about if you fulfill the royal law. Then we talked about in class number three, in much detail, Jesus came to fulfill the law. He made it very, very clear. I'm not come, Matthew 5, 17, to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And then we went through in as much detail as we could in the class talking about how Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets, how everything that he did was fulfilling stuff. I mean, Matthew is just, he's fulfilling scriptures every time he turns around. And we talked about the fact that that the handwriting of ordinances was blotted away, and we've looked at some of that, and the earthly ordinances that existed in Hebrews chapter 9, how that you could do those ordinances, and you can walk in them, and you can have relationship with God. This is why Zechariah and Elizabeth were blameless before God. Um, and we saw that as Jesus fulfilled them, the main reason we don't have to do all those things is because we don't need them to to relate to God because we've been brought back into a new covenant. He made a covenant with Adam and Adam broke it. He made a covenant with the descendants of Abraham and they broke it. He has made a covenant in Christ Jesus and men break it. But the difference is this covenant's an everlasting covenant. This covenant never ends. 
This covenant goes on forever. This covenant is the only one that matters. This is not, this is not another attempt. This is, this is it. Because now it's the faith of Christ Jesus. It doesn't rely on man. It doesn't rely on the flesh. It doesn't rely on your ability. It doesn't rely on anything. It relies solely on Jesus and you believing on him. And he does the work. And we've been given the earnest of our inheritance, the Holy Ghost. So then we see this fulfillment and we see this new covenant and how we draw close to God by the blood of Christ Jesus. It's We don't need the blood of bulls and goats and heifers and things. We don't need that because we have the blood of Jesus. And all we have to do is call upon him and we're set apart. And in the same way that he wanted them to fear him, so he showed himself, he says to us, I want you to fear me. I want you to understand that I will in no wise clear the guilty. He said it in Exodus 34. God does not wink at sin. He sends the Holy Ghost now to be the one who convinces us of sin. And if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. It's Jesus Christ the righteous that we can repent and the sin will be washed away and we can come right back into that same fellowship that used to be in all these ordinances and these washings and these rituals that they would do year after year and week after week that they would do. And we don't have those anymore. We have one simple set of ordinances that are meant to just help us to understand we have communion where we love one another and we share in the wine and the bread we share in the the body and the blood of Christ Jesus we have baptism that that is a not what saves us but it's a figure of what has happened to us we have these ordinances it's basically it um and this new covenant, we talked about this new covenant, which is the same as the everlasting covenant. And we talked about the fact that this was testified in the prophets and Jesus came and fulfilled it and he made this covenant. He cut this covenant and this covenant is everlasting. So we then related you circumcision as a way of helping to understand this earthly ordinances that was important throughout this entire time from Abraham all the way down and how the church dealt with it, and what the conclusion was, that this earthly thing will not bring you into fellowship with God. But it does testify of what will. Faith and a new creation. The faith of Christ Jesus and a new creation. And then we come to this, just to read this again, the finality of all of this. For as many as of the works of the law are under the curse, Galatians 3.10, for it is written, cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. you got to start from the beginning and do them all. You know, I, I wasn't circumcised the eighth day. I wasn't of the stock of Israel. I didn't have all those advantages Paul had, and he called them nothing. Look, I, I, I couldn't even get started right, so there was no way for me to get this done. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. It is evident why. For the just shall live by faith. So be righteous. Call yourself righteous. Know that you've been made righteous by Christ Jesus. Be blessed this week and we'll see you next time.